Hello and welcome to another episode of Disappeared the Abyss. Tonight we're talking about the disappearance of John Spira, and this disappeared episode was called When the Music Stopped. Jacob, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Alina? Doing well. Also excited to talk about tonight's disappeared case. John Spira disappeared at age 45 from West Chicago on February 23rd, 2007. On the day before John Spira disappeared, he went to Brian's Char House, a restaurant that he was a regular at, and he was known as Chicago Johnny because he was a musician and played several instruments, and he was friends with Brian, so Brian's the owner of Brian's Char House, and Brian remembers that they were friends for a long time, even before um, John disappeared. John would basically be there every night. Uh, John's sister, Stephanie, explains that Brian's was just across the road from where John worked, that he used to play there, and that his pictures were even up on the walls. When John met his girlfriend, Renata, at Brian's, that night he seemed unusually stressed. She assumed that he was stressed because he was getting a divorce and it was supposed to be finalized the next day on Friday after a two-year divorce battle. At this point, he was still living in one house with his wife. According to his brother, John and his soon-to-be ex-wife avoided each other as much as possible and lived at opposite ends of the home. A major reason for the divorce battle taking so long was that they both loved the home so much and didn't want to give it up. John had the same breakfast every morning at the same restaurant, two eggs over medium, hash browns, white toast, and bacon. Just as every other morning, this is what he had for breakfast on the day he disappeared. The day of his disappearance, he was going through the final negotiation about his divorce from his wife. After breakfast, he went back to his house for an important phone call to work out the settlement details for their divorce. So, wondering if uh, that's a coincidence. Um, is the ex-wife going to be on the show? At this point, we haven't seen her, um, but I always feel... I don't know if they're not on the show already makes me suspicious of them. Same. Maybe it's too soon at this point, but yeah. And um, if not, yeah, do we think it's a red flag? Um, yeah. What do you think? I think this was just, to me, a sign that there's some stress going on right now in this man's life. Obviously, like a divorce is a really difficult thing to go through. And when you have what you know is going to be a disappeared case, I was just thinking about this from his perspective and uh, about to finalize this process that has been a long time coming. And you know how tough that is to negotiate for what you want with someone that you were formerly in a relationship with. So I was kind of just putting myself in his head and being like, maybe this is part of the reason that he just needs to disappear or take some time for himself. Um, if that's what ends up happening, it just seems like a pivotal moment in someone's life come, you know, after marriage and there could be divorce and it's another one of those kind of milestones and that could be setting things up for what is, um, about to happen. That's true. It must definitely have been an emotional time for him. John had met Suzanne in the early 1980s at a local blues club in Chicago and it was love at first sight. He was there that night together with, with his sister, and he went to get them drinks, but he didn't return to the table. He was talking to Suzanne, and they just hit it off. They appeared to be the perfect couple, but then in 1995, a family tragedy destroyed their world. Spare's ste stepdaughter in New York killed her boyfriend in a heated argument. His sister remembers that Suzanne struggled to deal with that, and that things never were the same after. Instead of traveling back and forth to be at the trial, Spears' wife Suzanne moved to Buffalo, New York. 
and Sparrow himself flew out there as often as he could to support his wife. They slowly grew apart over the next 12 years nonetheless. On that phone call, they agreed on the terms of their divorce and to sign the papers the following week. On the afternoon of February 23rd, John was at a business meeting together with his friend Jim that uh, was related to the underground cable company that John runs. And he was there until around 3, 3.30 or so in the afternoon. At that business meeting, John seems rather upbeat. His divorce seems to be settled after that meeting. He seems to be chipper and doing well. Um, Jim remembers that John was overall pretty positive and actually he doesn't remember a time where John seemed happier like this is kind of the peak for him after this stressful event he says John even made plans with Jim for the next day um, because he wanted to perform with uh, his band that they were in together and that they would have dinner together to me this was kind of suspicious I don't know I was thinking about it kind of like in the sense of it seems like a mood swing where you have this really stressful event going on and you maybe been kind of depressed or low and then like things are really dramatically changing um and you're now over the moon and it just seems like it just screams unstable to me so another kind of like possible explanation why there might be a disappearance is another big change and another something just is going on in his head perhaps so what would you make of that those mood swings so does to you does that mean it's an indicator that he might want to go missing that he may be suicidal anything like that um is that what you're hinting at I, or? I think it just to me signals some instability um in the sense that maybe he's trying to compensate for what has been a really rough time and trying to convince himself that like that's over and that is behind him. But I, I think it, it just shows that there's maybe some inauthentic inauthenticity there because like to be done with the divorce is a good thing, but to be like the happiest you've ever been probably isn't really how he was feeling or probably isn't how people really would be in that scenario. I mean, it's still a divorce. Yes, it's finalized and you're glad to be done with it. But I think he just seems a little too happy about it, um, which signals that maybe there's just something else going on behind the scenes that could contribute perhaps to his disappearance. Or like I said, yeah, maybe wanting to get a little uh, get away for a little while and kind of take in um, the events that have unfolded now and what this means for the rest of his life. Also, not to correct you, but to correct you, I think you said that his friend Jim uh, played in the same band, but he was actually supposed to watch them play and have right. dinner with him. So just to You're clear right. that up, even though it's not the most important thing about Thank the you. story. <laughs> yeah, so... John left Jim's business and heads to his own office, and in the next few hours, he was working at his desk. After finishing all the paperwork, he gets ready to leave the office, and he calls his girlfriend to make dinner plans for the evening. Now, Renata explained to him that she would actually rather work. I guess she had some work that she needed to do a little later, and he was a bit upset about that. Um, but she suggests that he just call someone else and, you know, maybe she could possibly join them later on when she's caught up with the work that she needs to do. So when they hang up the phone, it's 5.30 p.m. now. He said goodbye to his business partner and walked out the door. So he seems a little upset that, you know, his girlfriend didn't have time for him that night um and it's also a little unclear if it was confirmed exactly what happened after that phone conversation the show's not very clear about like we know he allegedly walked out the door that night but there's not a lot of details surrounding what's a pretty important time you know the last time that he will eventually or the last time that he'll be seen here yeah and they don't say you know who was the last to, person to have seen him was it his uh, business partner? Was it some employee? Uh, be interesting to know. Or was it several people, which would make it even more credible that that ever happened, you know? Yeah, there's just not much kind of information about this point. Um, and 
it's a detriment to the case because that's the last thing we know about his whereabouts. He never calls his girlfriend to tell her where he was going to get dinner or to say good night. It's very out of character for him. Um, when Renata returns home, there's no message from John, and she's surprised. She's getting ready to go for bed here and still not hearing for uh, hearing from him. Throughout the night, she tries to reach him without any luck. At some point, she stops calling him and thinks that maybe he's just mad at her for not being able to meet him for dinner that night. On the next day, she still doesn't hear from John, and she's just getting more and more anxious, but... She knows or believes that she will at least see him later that night at the concert because he never misses those. And at the same time, John's friend Jim is becoming concerned. He was supposed to meet John before that uh, concert, and it had started to also snow pretty, pretty heavily around Chicago at this point. He tried to call John to make plans for the night because they hadn't really figured out the details of you know, like who was going to drive and what time and everything like that. Um, so he's trying to reach out to him, too, and no one seems to hear from John. When Renata arrived at the club, she noticed that John's truck was not in the parking lot. Her first thought was that maybe something was wrong with his truck, and he got a ride from one of the other guys. She noticed that John was not there when they were first starting to perform their first song, and he wasn't on stage. She had to wait until they were done with their song, which to her, quote, felt like a million years. When she realized that none of the band members had talked to him that day, she started to get the feeling that something was very wrong. John was never late to a gig. Not showing up at all meant that something was seriously wrong. John's sister remembers that he'd play gigs even if he had 103 degrees temperature. He had a passion for making music ever since he was a child. His brother remembered that every job John worked, he was saving for a guitar or some other music equipment and just loved to play. Over the past two decades, he built a name for himself as a local musician. His brother proudly explains that John played five or six instruments and then was a diehard musician. Once Renata realizes that he wasn't there, she drove home to see if he was at his home. But as she was driving, the snowstorm started to get worse, and she drove even though you couldn't even see the roads anymore. And it wasn't just the snow, but it was slushy snow and ice. She decided to call 911 that night because she was so concerned about John. Renata asked them for a welfare check, at his house and described his truck to them but she is told by police that she can't file the report because she is not the next of kin. She asked them what she could do in a case of emergency like this one and she remembers that everyone around her was so calm. She describes it like it was in one of those thriller movies where everyone's just trying to calm you down and trying to tell you that it's all in your mind. And when I saw her basically um, going through the, you know, remembering uh, that night and her emotions and everything still seemed, um, it seemed like it was yesterday when she talked about it. And you could just tell how frustrating that must have been. Um, and it must suck. I mean, I get why people are trying to calm you down. Um, but if you're just in a panic and you think you have all reason to be and everyone trying to calm you down and probably not taking you seriously, I, I don't know how Super I would react. Yeah. yeah, especially because she's the one who's like closest to him at this point. And so she knows his patterns and what he normally would and, and wouldn't do. And clearly, you know, we always see this with um different police departments too about how they how seriously they do or don't take cases and obviously something for her in her mind is sending alarms right now that like this isn't normal like something has happened to him and i was thinking about that too you know what has happened to him just based on what we know at this point and I would agree with her that this is, seems very out of the ordinary for him out of everything that's been described about him and 
him, you know, reaching out to friends and showing up when he says he's going to be somewhere, that sort of thing. I think this indicates that um, something has happened to him, whether or not it's foul play or an accident or um, whatever situation or circumstances that were outside of his control. I think um, he is just not able to fulfill his commitments or reach out to people at this time, which is a sign that something's wrong. Renata contacts the police again and pleads with them to do a welfare check on John at his office. And she also doesn't wait. She starts her own investigation. Uh, she drives to his office together with a friend of hers to search the area. And when she looks over the fence at, the, at John's work, she can see that his truck is in the parking lot. She jumped the fence and started to look for him all over the property, but isn't able to find anything. And without a missing persons report, the police also can't look for him. They need John's now estranged wife to fill out a missing persons report. When police call his wife, she tells them that she doesn't think that he's missing. Police suggest that maybe he flew out to visit his mother. Uh, she had just had surgery the week before, and they think or suggest that maybe he just didn't have the time to tell anyone about this visit that he was going to have. John was also a pilot, and he flew regularly at the local flight club. And since he was an experienced pilot, he knew not to fly in a snowstorm, though, which is what the conditions were like at that time. And that's why Renata doesn't believe that theory that he just, you know, got in a plane and decided to fly. Police, though, convince her to check with John's parents in Arizona to see if he is there by chance. And she does. And Renata finds out that he is not with his family, just like she thought. John had booked tickets to fly to Arizona to visit his family, but it was for the week after this. So that kind of uh, shoots a hole in the theory that maybe he was just going to visit his family or his mom. Once police finally start to investigate, they are two days behind now and kind of behind the eight ball. They have to jump into action. They begin searching John's business, the location where we know he was last seen and where his truck was still parked that evening police searched the immediate area on foot as well they went through the outside and the inside of the business two times but aren't able to locate john or really any signs of him apparently john never went anywhere without his car even if it was just down the block or down the road so for that to be there and not have john is also very unusual the next morning, they launched a search in the area around John's business, which is surrounded by isolated fields and forest preserves, so kind of some challenging uh, conditions to look through. The temperatures are also freezing with all the snow and everything, and it's covered in ice. Jim believes that the massive amount of snow and the ice that came down since John went missing probably made the search more difficult, must have made the search more difficult for police. Uh, they even bring in search dogs to cover that area more quickly. And at this point, they know they might be looking for a body. Uh, police look into John's phone records, and that shows that his phone remained active for several hours after he was last seen at work. The activity happened on the evening of the 23rd when he disappeared around his business, and it was tracked by several cell phone towers. Police use that information to search in those areas, but it's a really wide area, so it's kind of helpful, but it's not really narrowing it down too much. It's still a, a large area to search around his work. Uh, due to the size of the land, they use ATVs to cover more ground, but despite all of this effort, they are not able to find any trace of John. So to generate more leads, investigators try to come up with a timeline of the 24 hours before John went missing. They're interviewing family and friends and really just hoping for any sort of clues that could help them narrow this investigation because they don't have a lot to go on at this point. But everything that they find suggests that he just had a normal day once he arrived at the office that day. And when they interview employees at John's business... They found out something interesting, though, that a large roll of industrial plastic wrap 
uh, was missing on the Monday after John disappeared. So he left uh, the office apparently on Friday and people come back into work on Monday and the police are asking them, you know, is anything out of the ordinary here at work? Anything missing or taken or not where it should be? And the employees say, yes, this big roll of industrial plastic wrap that we had inside is now gone. Um, which seems like a red flag to me, Alina. I don't know. What do you make of that? Sounds like a huge red flag to me, too. Um, sounds perfect to use to get rid of a body. Uh, it's just really odd that be missing, and if that's what the employees are noticing, then it sounds like it's not usual for something to like that to just be gone, you know, over the weekend. Um, and then where would that have gone if there is like any other explanation? Wouldn't that have come up? So to me, I mean, if you had me, you know, bet on it, then I'd say like, yeah, I'll bet on this having to do with his disappearance, you know? Um, I think, yeah, it's too coincidental if not, especially we don't really know like what happens there over the weekend if they do work or anything like that. But um, even if they did, there would be employees that would probably know where it went or what happened to it or, oh, yeah, we used it for this project. But the fact yeah. that they're coming back over this weekend and they're like, yeah, everything's the same except that giant roll of plastic that we had <laughs> over there in the corner is now gone and no one seems to have any explanation about why. I think it's definitely suspicious. Like, someone had to have known. Someone had access to that building um and it went somewhere but the fact that no one who works there can explain it is is alarming investigators don't believe it's a coincidence that the plastic wrap disappeared on the same weekend john disappeared once john's dad learns about the plastic wrap being missing he said quote well there's no hope now after john was missing for one week friends and family have to consider that john may not be found his company has all sorts of digging equipment and when you hear that and they uh, talk about it a little more in detail then you think well even though there was snow and ice and for a regular person with a shovel it probably would have been hard to dig with this kind of equipment it wouldn't be that hard at least as you if you know how to handle it i guess what do you think yeah i wish they would have had more like um, details on the investigation because it's definitely suspicious that you know you have all this div digging equipment available but wouldn't it be like relatively easy to be like oh this looks like it was used recently or oh it was taken out to here or if you have like a huge earth mover when they're doing their searches isn't gonna won't it be more obvious if there's like disturbed ground you know around the area like it you know it's not subtle if you're taking out digging equipment like there's got to be some signs that would be left behind so it's interesting that they have that but i feel like they would notice too if something had been moved or was used somewhere or just like following the tracks of a big piece I of equipment kinda i kind of disagree <laughs> oh because, tell me why because well, if you're thinking about have, has it been used recently, then probably yes. Probably most of this equipment has been used recently and it will show signs of that. I, I doubt they clean it every weekend, you know. Um, and so it wouldn't be suspicious that, you know, some of it has some dirt on it um, and looks used because it has been used. You know, that that I feel like would probably not be that easy. Um, and then if you are in this industry, assuming someone, yeah, from the firm, you know, who knows how to handle this equipment has something to do with his disappearance, then maybe you know where there's bigger, like larger areas where large amounts of, of dirt and ground is being moved and where you can, you know, get rid of a body like so deep down, like, or in, you know, an area where there's already construction happening that it wouldn't be unusual to see disturbed grounds. Like, I'm not saying they would take it like to some undisturbed ground where then it would stick out, you know, um, to everyone who comes across it and be like, yeah, what happened here? Um, but you may have insight knowledge that helps you to really find the perfect spot to get rid of a body. So I, I still get what you're saying. And if they were lucky, then I could see it go that way. But if someone was smart about it, then I could also see it go 
another way with it you know yeah i think what you said is key like if someone has inside knowledge of the situation which if they're able to use that equipment and have the skills then they probably do because they probably um, are familiar with that facility and operating that type of equipment then they might be better suited to kind of hide what they're doing I just mean if I go to work and I park my car one way let's say and then I come back a couple days later and suddenly it's in like a different parking spot or it's backed in or it's something like that or it's in a different position like you might be able to tell but if you also operate the business maybe you don't mention those things or you aren't paying close enough attention or the or machines are always parked a little different and then you wouldn't know exactly how they're parked that friday because they're always in a slightly different location if, yeah if that and was we... true unless it was always the same way then yes it'd be easier for employees to be like well now it looks moved you know but and there's no real mention of like security camera footage yeah. or photos or anything like that so it's hard to kind of reconstruct what the scene looked and how it changed or didn't change um, between those few days of this investigation it definitely just lets us know that potentially with this equipment you could dig in this in this uh, ground under these weather conditions even if for a regular person that wouldn't necessarily be so easy um Friends and family are convinced that the missing plastic wrap is a key clue to his disappearance. John's brother just hoped that John wasn't aware of what was happening when he died and that it was quick. So it kind of sounds like to him, um, he's dead. Is that yeah. what it sounded like to you too? Yeah, I, or at least that's their, sounds like their leading theory at this point. Yeah, yeah. Family and friends continue their search around the business, also using metal detectors and even bring in professional support, like Equus search teams, but they don't find anything. So they decide to put a banner up across the street of John's business. The next day, someone ripped it down and they decide to put up another banner. And then that one gets destroyed as well within 24 hours. Investigators consider if John may have disappeared on purpose and they claim that the information they have in John's case could take them in either direction. So either the direction of foul, foul play or a willful disappearance. His friends and family can't imagine that he would have disappeared willfully, especially because his mother was still recovering from surgery and he had plans to meet her the next week. So... I was kind of frustrated because it doesn't seem like police um, told the public why they think he may have disappeared willfully. Um, and that would be really interesting to know because with everything we know at this point, you can uh, lean uh, probably more towards foul play. But if you yeah. give us some reasons... Uh, <laughs> then yeah, it would just be very interesting to know, you know, what, the, what I they kind know, of what got they, the impression yeah. that maybe what they were thinking is they just don't have enough concrete leads in either direction. And it's their job to kind of investigate all options and not like get tunnel vision, which is what we see with a lot of police departments, honestly, where they're kind of like, well, this is our leading theory and we're just going to investigate this and kind of ignore all these other options. I kind of liked what they did where they said, yeah, we see the evidence that this could be foul play, but there's also nothing strong enough that we're only going to look at it from that lens because, you know, maybe it was this, maybe he did leave on his own accord. And if we just ignore that possibility, we're going to be spinning our wheels for a while trying to track down something that didn't happen. So I like that they're kind of open-minded about it. And the way they phrase it in the show, according to the police, is that the family doesn't, you know, like the fact that they are investigating it maybe as a willful disappearance, but the family also gets why. Like, they, you know, understand that the police are just trying yeah. to look at things from multiple perspectives. Yeah, if that's the reason why they they stated that, then that's good. I, I just thought it, it kind of sounded to me like maybe there is something more they know that they're holding back, but I may be wrong. And, and yeah, yeah if, if that's just what they're doing, then that's obviously great. 
Nearly seven months after John's disappearance, his name is in the news again because a fire destroyed his cabling business. And this actually happens only 24 hours after the second banner uh, was destroyed. So there's lots of speculation, lots of talk about this fire, whether it's related to this investigation, whether it's just a freak coincidence, you tend to lean on the side of this can't be a coincidence. Yeah, I wouldn't say it can't be. It just seems like it would be a crazy coincidence. Like it could be, but what's the likelihood, especially with the proximity to to the banner, you know, being taken down twice and if it was just, yeah, it burned down seven months after he went missing, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of odd that that happened. So still sort of soon after he disappeared, but just especially, and we know the banners were put up, you know, across the street from the business. So it's almost like someone felt pressured or, you know, the heat was on. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, what was up, literally you know? the heat was on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. I think it is kind of, too um suspicious to be a, a coincidence like the timing between the banner's disappearance and being just seven months after his disappearance as well um it, it's still pretty fresh i'm sure for that community there um unfortunately though no clues ever surfaced from this fire to the great disappointment of john's family Police also are not able to determine what caused the fire, so that doesn't really help things either. We don't know if this was set or was intentional or accidental, um, and John is, has been missing ever since then, um, and the family was kind of hoping maybe this fire would drum up some leads, but it doesn't seem that that really ever happened. Now, since the show aired, um, there have been some minor updates, some more kind of speculation on behalf of uh, folks who are trying to figure out what happened. There's one article that I found from Patch, um, and I was just going to read it because it reveals some more information about John's business dealings, which are also the source of some speculation about his disappearance. So we'll just read this article. The business partner of missing St. Charles man, John Spira, accused him of racking up massive debt in excess of $1 million and speculated that this prompted him to skip town, according to police reports that were recently obtained by Patch. Spira's partner at Universal Cable Construction, David Stubbin, also theorized that Spira might have been taking money from the business and would not rule out that the missing man had something to do with a suspicious fire that gutted the company building months after he vanished. Now, the DuPage County Sheriff's Department surrendered about 350 pages of reports on John's disappearance following a request that was made under the Illinois Freedom of Information Act. And Spira's sister, Stephanie, has waged and also won a six-month Freedom of Information fight of her own with the county cops. And she, at the time of this writing, had apparently yet to receive copies of those police reports from her brother's disappearance. So this is kind of interesting because as you were mentioning um, a moment ago, what do we know or what do the cops know that they're maybe not telling us about why he may have willfully disappeared? And this could have been something that they were certainly thinking about at the time if they're getting word from his business partner um, that maybe he did rack up some debt or maybe he was doing some illegal things with the business. And uh, he needed to disappear and maybe set a fire um, to cover his tracks. What do you think? Well, this is like definitely interesting information, like good to know. And uh, I wonder if they just didn't know about this when they were filming Disappeared because it was never brought up in any way. I still, it makes me, you know, think about like who's saying this because we've definitely discussed cases Um where someone's trying to steer the investigation in a certain direction and if you have something to do with the disappearance then it would be good for you or in your best interest if the police uh, investigate in a different direction and that this would definitely accomplish that so uh, i'm not saying it's all false like I, I we don't know but 
I, I just want to be open for either direction, I think, because, yeah, you, you just always have to be careful and not just take everyone's word for it, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, this could be a way to deflect or avoid suspicion or, you know, kind of plant a theory in the minds of police when you want to take the attention off of you um, and you kind of wonder what are their motivations for offering up this information and what kind of evidence do they have too? Um, you know, did was he able to prove this? Was money missing? Were there documents that um, were able to lend any credence to these claims um, that he had massive debt? Debt would be trackable, right? If he had more than a million dollars, yeah. there would certainly be some creditors that would um, want him or unless maybe he was, you know, getting that money through illegal channels or something like that and maybe and, it was yeah and just from this article it doesn't sound like they have evidence it sounds like they have his opinion or what he, yeah his statement like what he says um so if there was evidence at the point that this article was written written then they didn't discuss it and they yeah. would have i, I assume if, if there was evidence if the police came out like we know this you know yeah um, so it just makes me even more suspicious because it's such a yeah like you said such a large amount of money that i'd feel like yeah okay even if you weren't doing um the paperwork for the business and and john was then still this amount of money you'd be able to prove that you know they there was debt or he embezzled money um so why isn't why isn't this like evident to me i think one of the takeaways from that is that his disappearance might have had to do with his work regardless of how it related whether he was doing something nefarious or his business partner was doing something nefarious it seems like the business dealings are pretty crucial everything that happens to john seems to center around his business i mean it's the last place he's seen it's where his his car is at it's what burns down it's where the posters are like clearly there's something going on with this business and not necessarily john's personal life however convoluted that has been with a divorce and everything but it seems like there's something going on here and we still to this day don't know because the case is unsolved i agree that that's the most likely a scenario i do want to point out still that it's possible someone is trying to you know locate the truck there and have the phone be in the area and i mean it would be a length to go to to set this all up and and really yeah make investigators focus on his business through you know planting all this evidence basically um but it's not impossible. I'm not saying it's the most likely. I don't think that. I, th I agree with what you just said. But I want to also point out this angle that you could look at or consider. Yeah. I think that's definitely one of the things that makes this case interesting is there are multiple ways you can look at it. Um, and I think that's part of what police were trying to do and trying to be cognizant of that and that there's no way at this point that they've said that they can rule any one particular thing out. Thank you for listening to another episode of Disappeared the Abyss. Tune in next time.